Chapter Three of Our Little Australian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Little Australian Cousin by Mary F. Nixon Roulet. Chapter Three A Drive. A few days' rest made the travellers as good as new, and Fergus and Jean were ready for any kind of an adventure. They went about the city interested in each and everything they saw, for they were bright little children, full of spirits to the brim. "'We are to take a drive this afternoon,' said Mrs. MacDonald one morning. "'Your Uncle Angus is going to show you Warner Nowiewich, which means Home of the Swallow. It is the largest squatter station anywhere about here, and it is as handsome as any noble estate at home.' "'That will be jolly, Aunt Mildred,' said Fergus, who loved driving. "'When luncheon was over, they all seated themselves in Mr. MacDonald's comfortable road-cart, "'and his fine span of horses pranced along the Sydney streets. "'We are passing St. Andrew's Cathedral now,' said Mrs. MacDonald, "'and there is St. Mary's Cathedral, which is equally fine. "'There is the Governor's Mansion, the Museum, the Art Gallery, "'and now we are entering Hyde Park.' "'Isn't it beautiful? "'The waterworks of Sydney are excellent, "'and the water supply never fails. "'It comes sixty-three miles from the Nepean River "'and is stored in a huge reservoir. "'Even in the hottest weather "'there is enough water to keep our parks green and beautiful. "'You are very enthusiastic over your adopted country,' "'said her sister teasingly. "'Indeed I am. "'I have learned to love Australia, "'the rural life better than the urban.' "'You wait till we go up to the run, "'and see if the charm of the bush country doesn't hold you.' "'Mrs. MacDonald smiled. "'Now we are entering the grounds of Werna Weewitch. "'Tell me, is the Duke of Argyle's place finer?' "'They drove over the estate, which was surpassingly beautiful. "'I have heard so much of the Australian bush, "'and how wild and bare it is,' said Fergus, "'that I had no idea that there was anything here so fine as this.' "'What magnificent trees!' said his mother. "'Those are the eucalyptus, the gum-trees for which Australia is famous,' said Mr. MacDonald. "'The eucalyptus grows to an enormous height. "'Many of the trees are one hundred fifty feet high and eleven feet round the trunk. "'In some places they grow to be twenty feet in diameter. "'They are not good shade-trees because the leaves, which are shaped like little lances, "'grow straight up and down.' "'that is, with one edge toward the sun. "'But in spite of that, the tree is one of the most useful in the world. "'There are nearly 150 varieties of eucalyptus, "'and most of these are found in Australia. "'The lumber is used for all kinds of building purposes. "'Many of the trees contain a hard substance, manna, "'from which we get a kind of sugar called melitose. "'Others give us kino, a resin used in medicine. "'The bark yields tannin, and from one variety with stringy bark we get a fibre used for making rope, the manufacture of paper, and for thatching roofs. From the leaves an oil is distilled, which is much used in medicine, being particularly good to dress wounds and for the treatment of fevers. "'It seems to me that these trees furnish almost everything you need,' said Mr. Hume. "'If you include the birds who nest in them, and the animals who climb in the branches,' "'replied his brother-in-law. "'I fancy the blacks did not need to look beyond the eucalyptus for a living. "'The wood built their huts, and the bark thatched them. "'From the fibre they made mats for their floor, "'and hats to keep off the sun, and clothes, "'which consisted of waist-cloth and sandals. "'The leaves gave them medicine for the fever and salve for their wounds. "'The cockatoos nesting in the branches furnished them delicious food, "'while of the feathers the gins, that is, black women, made boas for their necks, and wonderful Easter bonnets. It really would seem as if the gum trees were all they really needed. They have another use not to be slighted, for they take up the moisture rapidly and dry the soil in rainy seasons, thus reducing the malaria always found in such climates as these. "'They are certainly useful,' said Mrs. Hume. "'Is this the station to which we are going?' as they drove through a fine gateway. "'Yes,' said Mrs. MacDonald. "'Warner Weewitch is quite up-to-date in every way. 
the house cost thirty thousand pounds to build, and the ranch has every modern improvement. The grazing land hereabouts is perfectly adapted to sheep raising. It is so rich that you may dig ten feet down and still find rich black dirt. The owner of this ranch has been most successful. He has recently put in new wool sheds, sheep pens, washing ponds, and the like, and you may, if you wish, see the whole process of sheep raising, shearing, pressing, packing, and transporting the wool. You will see it at our station on a smaller scale. They drove for an hour about the magnificent place, and over all the estate was an air of wealth and prosperity. The gardens were blooming with gay tropical flowers, and the songs of the birds were in the air, as they flitted hither and yon through the branches of the magnificent trees. "'What is that noise, Aunt Mildred?' asked Jean, as they drove through a beautiful grove of pines, which scented the air deliciously. "'It sounds like a faraway church bell.' "'It is the bell-bird, dear, one of the curiosities of Australia,' replied her aunt. "'Long, long before there was a church-bell of any kind in Australia, "'this lonely little bird made its curious bell-like note. "'There are some pretty verses by one of our poets about it. "'Can you say them to us, Auntie?' "'I will try. They are really beautiful,' she said. "'Tis the bell-bird sweetly singing,' The sad, strange, small-voiced bird, His low, sweet carol ringing, While scarce a sound is heard, Save topmost sprays a-flutter, And withered leaflets fall, And the wistful oaks that utter Their eerie, dreary call. What may be the bell-bird saying In that silvery, tuneful note, Like a holy hermit's praying His devotion seemed to float, From a cavern, dark and lonely, Where, apart from worldly men, He repeats one dear word only, fondly, o'er and o'er again. "'Is not that pretty?' said Mrs. Hume, as her sister's musical voice ceased. "'I did not know you had such poets in Australia.' "'Indeed, we have a literature of our own,' said Mrs. MacDonald, "'and very beautiful things are written by Australians. You have much to learn about this great island continent of ours.' "'Now we must turn toward home,' said Mr. MacDonald, and his wife said, "'Drive back past Tarnpin. It is so beautiful about there. Tarnpin, or flowing water, is a favourite spot hereabouts. The blacks have a quaint story about its origin, and I will tell it to you as old Tepal, a black chief, told it to me. It was the daytime, and all the animals died of thirst. So many died that the magpie, the lark, and the crane talked together, and tried to find water to drink. "'It is very strange,' said the magpie, "'that the turkey buzzard is never hungry.' "'He must, then, have water to drink,' said the wise crane. "'He flies away every morning very early,' said the lark. "'Let us rise before the sun and watch him,' said the magpie, and they agreed. Next morning the turkey buzzard rose early and crept from his worry, his hut. He looked this way and that and saw no one. Then he flew away. He knew not that two bright eyes peeped at him through the leaves of the great gum tree. He did not hear the peep-peep with which the lark awoke his friends. The lark, the magpie, and the crane flew high to the sky. They flew so high that they looked as specks on the sun. The turkey buzzard saw them, but thought they were small dark clouds. He flew to a flat stone and lifted it up, and the water gushed from a spring in the rock, and he drank and was satisfied. Then he put back the stone and flew away. The three friends laughed and were glad. Quickly they flew to the stone, singing, We have caught him, and drank of the fresh water. They bathed in the pool and flapped their wings until the waters rose and became a lake of clear water. Then they spread their wings and flew over the earth, and the waters dropped from their wings and fell to the thirsty earth. They made their water-holes, and ever since there have been drinking-places all over the land. "'My, but that's a jolly story,' said Fergus, the irrepressible. "'Did you really know the black, Aunt Mildred? Are there any around here?' "'None very near,' said his aunt. "'Indeed, they are mostly dying out.' People who have lived here a long time used to know them, and say they were a kindly people. 
They were very fond of children, and I do not think they were cruel or quarrelsome unless roused to anger. They have nearly all buried themselves in the bush, but you will be likely to see some of them at our station. There used to be a number around the run, and when we first came out we had some rather curious experiences with them. We do not see many now. Their experiences with white people were not always pleasant, I am sorry to say. I hope we shall see some of them, said Fergus. I like black people, said little Jean. What does she know of blacks? asked her aunt, smiling, and her mother replied. Some people from the States came to our farm one fall for the shooting, and they had a black nurse for the baby. Jean took a great fancy to her, and we simply couldn't keep her from toddling after Dinah. She was a faithful soul, so good and kind. "'Those who have lived here for many years say that if you once make a friend of a black, he will do anything for you,' said Mr. MacDonald. "'I have never had any trouble with them around my station, though other squatters did.' "'I think it's all in the way you treat them,' said his wife. "'Of course the blacks near the run are not the wild blacks from the interior, the man-eating kind, but a gentler race.' "'Well, I hope we shall see some of them,' said Fergus. "'But I shouldn't care for cannibals.' End of chapter 3, read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on Saturday, July 6th, 2013, in San Diego, California.